Marshall McLuhan said that one day we would all live in a global village, an electronic community interconnected by communications networks that would shrink the earth. Well, the global village has arrived, and its main street is called the Internet, where people from around the world do meet electronically to exchange ideas. Today, we'll surf the net, we'll explore the Internet, on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by Intel, microprocessor technology for the software of today and tomorrow. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. And by Hewlett Packard, personal computer division. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me today is David Shargell of Aladdin Systems. David, there's a little bit of interest in the Internet these days. There's a new book coming out every week just about on how to use the Internet. You guys have just come out with a new piece of software called Sitcom that makes it easy to log on to the Internet and move files up and back and so on. Uh, show us how Sitcom works. Okay. Well, I'm in my address book right now. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, I just typed in my name, my phone number, and my uh, ID and password. And I'm just going to save that address book entry and connect. It's that easy to try to connect. And what we're, we're logging on right now. We're getting right now onto Netcom, which is an internet dial-up. Okay. Uh, one of the things I did not show you in that uh, particular address book entry was a pop-up menu that has a list of all the services that Sitcom knows how to get onto. For example, the Well or the World, which are other very popular internet dial-up sites. Uh -huh. It also knows how to get onto CompuServe, Genie, MCI Mail, Dow Jones, a lot of commercial services automatically as well as local bulletin boards. What I mean by that is it knows when to type, where to type. Mm -hmm. For example, when the system asks for a password, it knows when to type the password. When the system asks for the name, it knows when to type the name. Okay, so we are just about to log on now, I see. And as you can see, it's typing connection the name, established. password, and we've just established a connection here. All right, so what can we do? I'm going to ask it to send me a file that I earlier got to my account on Netcom via FTP, or File Transfer Protocol, mm -hmm. and you can see it's now downloading that file via Zmodem. Once that file Transfer is here, it's done. I'm going to disconnect. I'm offline now. And it's automatically going to expand that file because it was in a stuff it format, mm -hmm. which is a popular format on the Macintosh. Right. If Connection I was dealing closed. with files from the PC, I can expand zip files, ARC files, or if I'm dealing with Unix, which is what the Internet is based on, I can get it Unix compressed files, TAR files, mm -hmm. UU code files. All so right. what I'm going to do now, I'm still within Sitcom, and I'm going to view the file that I just got it's already expanded, and here it is, the Clinton Inaugural Address. This is the full text that I got to my machine. And there it is. And it's pretty easy to do. All right, thank you. Today we'll spend some time on the Internet, and we'll visit folks who are doing all kinds of interesting things on Internet. Now, Internet started as a Defense Department network designed specifically to hook up different research centers around the country. So we'll begin with a brief history of the Internet by visiting the place where it all began, ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency in Arlington, Virginia. ARPA was formed by President Eisenhower after Sputnik, its mission to guard the U.S. against technological surprise. Pioneering work on networking technologies resulted in the birth of the Internet. Since the early days, Internet has provided vital communication links in the research community. The Internet is one of the major projects from the late 70s, early 80s. There's a long tradition of advanced te technology developments at ARPA, starting from the early time-sharing projects through computer graphics into computer networks through personal computing, and more recently to the new world of scalable high-performance computing. The most recent Internet-inspired development at ARPA is the Enterprise Room. That's Enterprise, as in Starship Enterprise. ARPA's Captain Kirk is Stephen Squires, Director of High Performance Communications Research. Oh, I'd like to welcome you to the bridge of the HPC Enterprise. Behind me, you see a view screen, which is a window into the country's high-performance computing and communications program. On the center screen, you can see a map representing all the bitways which are feeding the Washington area to which this facility is connected. Enterprise is the visual embodiment of all the advanced technologies coming out of the government's high-performance computing and communications program. And ARPA is not keeping Enterprise to itself. Researchers from around the country pop in via Internet connections or in person. It's created a whole new spirit of cooperation among the different agencies in the federal government and throughout the scientific community. People are able to share ideas and develop new things simply based upon their interest. 
Mosaic is one of those new developments. It's a hypertext interface that lets you browse any information service provided by the Internet. Mosaic was developed by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications with ARPA's support. The thing that makes Mosaic special is that it gives everyone access without there having to be uh, a, a rocket scientist. They don't have to be trained in esoteric uh, computing. Uh, grade school kids can use it. In fact, we're installing it in, in schools because it's a point-and-click interface. Uh, and that point-and-click, instead of going through information that's on your personal computer, it's as if there's a million computers on the Internet inside your own personal computer. These top-level researchers hope Mosaic lures more average computer users to the Internet, especially young people. All over the world, people, local people, ordinary people, are becoming electronic publishers. They're putting up the things that mean something to them and they want to share it with the rest of the world. And what Mosaic does is it provides a window into this incredible cyberspace, this information space that's developing. And it allows you to simply what we call net surf, looking for cool stuff. That's what the kids say they're doing. That's, what, that's the whole mentality of this. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. As we mentioned earlier, there are lots of books out now on the Internet, and one of the best is by Brendan Kehoe, who's our guest now. This is Brendan's book, Zen and the Art of the Internet, A Beginner's Guide, and there's a new edition just coming out in January, I guess. Okay. Brendan, I want to ask you to log on to the Internet, and while you're doing that, we're going to run over to NASA at Moffett Field in California to see how they are using the Internet. This is the operations center for the NASA Science Internet, the network that lets NASA mission scientists around the world share information. NASA provides information for public Internet access, but the NSI is strictly an insider network. The public cannot get an account on the NASA Science Internet. You have to be funded somehow by NASA. However, anyone with access to the Internet can access the public information that NASA, NASA makes available. The latest innovation on the NASA Science Internet is packet video. NASA has devised a way to compress the video and audio segments of conferencing for carriage on the Internet. All right, that makes, that's, uh, makes great sense. I understand it now. Thanks a lot, David. You're welcome. Packet video will cost a lot less than traditional video conferencing. Video conferencing facilities typically cost 10 to 20 times as much as the desktop video conferencing technology we're developing here at NASA. Also, the Interconnectivity between sites often costs 50 to $100 an hour, whereas using the Internet, we can transfer the material at approximately $10 an hour in wide area conferences, saving a tremendous amount. NASA is developing video hardware to reduce the signal load on the Internet and a whiteboard for document sharing. All of this technology may show up soon in schools nationwide. In three to five years, we expect to be able to put this technology into every school system in the country and share it for use in distance learning. And it can also be used for uh, sharing uh, valuable resources like a gifted instructor or a researcher in a wide area setting. Packet video currently transmits at two frames per second across the Internet. Stations running at 10 to 12 frames per second will be deployed within two years. We'll have uh, remote exploration vehicles sending back packet video information, uh, Antarctica missions, missions having to do with uh, using visualization technology and virtual reality technology, and using packet video to distribute these not only to researchers but to educational institutions. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Janelle Stelson. And we're back here with Brendan Kehoe, and you've logged on to Internet Brendan. Before we take a look, What's the big deal about Internet? Why is everybody making such a fuss about it? Why is it better than CompuServe or Prodigy, et cetera? Well, the chief benefit is that it's not owned by one company or even a conglomerate of companies like Prodigy or CompuServe. You're influenced by what those companies thought your users would want to do. Where on the Internet, anyone can put any service on and have it do anything they want with it at so any time. It's kind of user-controlled. Right. It's, it's completely molded by the people who use yeah. it. All right. Let's take a look and show me some of the neat things you can do on the Internet. Okay, the first thing we'll be doing is looking for a job a friend of, for a friend of mine who ha just got her teacher's certificate and she's in the Northeast. So we'll be using a tool called Gopher, which lets you burrow around the Internet and pop up where the information you need happens to be. And we're going into the Online Career Center. And this will let you s 
search the job listings. It'll also you let you search resumes if you're looking for people to work for you. Uh -huh. And here we'll search for the word teacher. It'll go and perform the search. So you're looking for a teacher's job in the Northeast? Right. Okay. And this is running on a machine in Michigan. And here we've got a wow. small list of, of positions. And let's say she wants to be a substitute teacher at the Bayview Healthcare Center. We'll get the list of contact information, the phone number, the requirements, salary, that kind of thing. That's pretty neat in itself. What else? And the next thing we'll be looking at is one of the more silly parts of the <laughs> internet. It's called a, it, Finger, which usually will let you go and check if people are logged into certain systems. But some people have set up the information that gets output by Finger to be whatever they want, like NFL scores or the bell bo billboard charts or that uh -huh. kind of thing. So here we're looking at the billboard charts for this week. And okay, top we'll R&B singles, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll see number five is Mariah Carey. Okay. So one thing we can do over the net is order that CD. With so our, you can't actually buy stuff on the internet. Right. It's, it's a very sticky situation because one of the biggest problems is security and transfer of money and that yeah, kind of yeah. thing. But uh, many systems have actually set it up so that you can do things on the internet involving money transfer and credit cards and that sort of thing. All right. What else? So here's so going we're buying into a CD the, right We're going now. into the compact disk connection. And as soon as it wakes up, one of, the, one of the drawbacks of using the internet is that since it's so autonomous, every system it can be up or down or be as slow as fast yeah, as you so want. So nobody's really controlling right, traffic in the middle. And the only guarantee is that your packets will get there. It's just a matter of when <laughs> they when, will get okay. there. Well, can we skip past this right now and look sure, at something else? Sure, this is taking a little long, so yeah. what we'll do is... So we'll skip we'll buying the CD at the moment. We'll get out of there. And now, now we'll go in and we'll use a thing, again, using Gopher, mm -hmm. to look up an article in the New Republic magazine. And we'll fix a typo, and there we go. And it will go into the electronic newsstand. Mm -hmm. And it, all of the articles in the current edition of many magazines are available through this, like the New Republic uh, Internet World, in fact, is actually one foreign affairs magazine. So now we'll go into the New Republic, and we'll go into the current issue and see what their editorial is about. It just happens to be about NAFTA. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is hit return on there, and there's you the editorial. You get a full-text article in Full there. text for it. And what we can also do now, now that we've read that editorial, is we can go over to a, another system, in this case, in University of Northern Colorado, North Carolina, uh -huh. and we'll use anonymous FTP. And by typing anonymous at the, pa the name prompt, and then use our email address as a password. You don't need a real password for this. Mm -hmm. This will let anyone put files available on the internet. And so in this case, we're gonna go into a public, a political science area. And if we do a directory, we'll see it has a whole bunch of stuff, the US budget. Wow. And now we'll, now we'll go into NAFTA. And we can see that we can get, actually get the full text of NAFTA including separated by the chapters yeah, and by the yeah. appendixes. Couple of quick questions. Uh, if I want to get onto internet, how do I do it? How do I get, get into internet? Uh, the best solution, since it all, it's very dependent upon where you live, uh -huh. is to call something called the Internet Helpline. And you call 1-800-444-4345. And then they'll help you find out who what's you should the, what's talk the best to, way to get in. in your local area. What on average is it going to cost to use internet? Between 10 and $20 a month. Right, for a normal user with a Brendan, thank you very much. You. All right, to get the most out of something like Internet, we really need that information superhighway to give us all a common digital data path. That's the goal of the developers at the Bell Communications Research Labs in New Jersey. Bellcore provides research support and communication services to the seven regional Bell operating companies. Projects there involve expansion of digital transmission pathways, such as the development of video on demand service transmitted over existing phone lines, and innovations in video conferencing, such as this desktop drop in system called Cruiser. Hi, Wayne. How you doing? Okay. Research director Steve Weinstein says the Internet plays a significant role in Belcor's work, both as a research tool and as a subject for high speed technology development. We believe that the public network, uh, the owners of Belcor, can be providers, as significant providers of the, those kinds of facilities that the future broadband internet is going to need. How people react to electronic forms of information is another subject of Belcor research. That's why Belcor decided to provide the Morris County Library System with a host connection to the internet. We've extended an existing interlibrary network that they had in Morris County, New Jersey. The existing network uh, had a consolidated catalog for the entire county. So all the libraries had terminals 
uh, public access terminals and also some other terminals that only the librarians use and had access to a consolidated catalog and circulation database. And what MoreNet is is an extension of this to connect this whole network to the outside world and make a lot more resources available. So far, the response has been enthusiastic. They realize how much it offers, that it's almost uh, a, there's a, a world out there and they're thrilled with the fact that they can jump from Maine to Australia back to San Francisco on the Internet and they love it. One of the items on the MoreNet menu is a Belcor creation called Superbook. It's a hypertext interface that lets internet network providers offer large searchable databases. What Superbook will do is allow them to maintain their uh, document database in a central location on the internet and then put out their documentation, uh, whether it's a journal or some other set of materials, uh, to a whole variety of end-user workstations ranging from an ASCII terminal all the way, all the way up to a very fancy uh, workstation. Mornet's internet connection also provides access for library patrons to university databases, weather information, and the CIA World Factbook. We're interested in making a more effective public communications network, and by public we mean something open to, to everyone. And this is, this is part of it, trying to make access broader, uh, easier, and more effective for a very wide public. And uh, we hope that uh, the knowledge we get here will help uh, not only our owners to be more effective providers, but will advance the whole national information infrastructure. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Janelle Patterson. The Internet is more than a technology. It's a sociological phenomenon which is redefining the word community. Here to show us that aspect of Internet is Howard Rheingold. Howard's the author of this book called The Virtual Community. And I want to ask you to sign on for us. And while we're waiting for you to log on, Howard, we're going to run over to Washington, D.C. to see one of the most innovative applications on the Internet. It's the world's first computer-delivered radio station. You've been listening to Geek of the Week on Internet Talk Radio. Carl Malamud is Internet Talk Radio. He produces audio data files at this studio in the National Press Club building, then uploads them onto the Internet via the World Wide Web. By sending mail to info at radio.com, you can access his interview program, Geek of the Week, and recordings of the National Press Club luncheon series. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or accessing it on the global internet computer network. It's one of those ideas that started as a hobby and kind of went nuts. Um, I wrote books about computers. I wrote seven books and I wrote magazine articles and I was looking for a magazine about the internet and there wasn't one and I wanted to start one. But that's expensive because you have to print paper and you have to mail paper and you have to audit who gets the paper so you can get it back to your advertisers. And I decided, gee, let's do something on the network. Unlike a normal broadcast station which transmits programming on a regular schedule, Malamud's cyber station is asynchronous radio. Our radio is a kind of radio station which you pull up when you want. You come in in the morning, a phone call comes in, you put the radio on hold. You decide you're tired, you put it on hold again. You cut out the part you don't like, you just chop it out. You don't like my restaurant reviews, I love doing restaurant reviews, but you don't like them, you just want to hear the technical meat, you cut them out. This non-linear digital approach to journalism raises both ethical and procedural questions that Malamud looks forward to discussing on the Internet. We need to start seeing the Nina Totenbergs of the world showing up on the Internet, and we also want the individuals of the world being able to publish themselves. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Janelle Stelson. And we're back with Howard Rheingold. And Howard, let's get back to the virtual community notion. And you're logged on to something called the well. How does that relate to the Internet? Well, if you think of the Internet as a digital superhighway, then all that information you can get, that's like libraries, and all of that software you can get, those are like warehouses. Mm -hmm. The well is like a community where people live. It's not just information or products that you're looking for. It's connecting with other people. And there are many communities accessible through the Internet. All right, show us on the well the kinds of communities you're talking about. Well, communities are really built from people talking with each other. And this is about using computers to structure communications between humans. So here's a list of all of the general topics that people discuss in topic areas. So you have social responsibility and politics, and that includes everything from environment mm -hmm. to firearms. There are hundreds of discussions in each one of those conference areas. Media and communications, you can see there are dozens of different topics there. 
business and livelihood, this screen will go on for minutes. And each of these conferences is really the recording, if you will, of all the discussions that have taken place between all the members of this community, right? That's right. It's as if you walked into a cocktail party and you reeled back a conversation to the beginning so you could see what people were talking about. All right, how do you use this? Give me an example of one of the conferences you would be involved okay, in. Okay, well, one that has a lot of heart and a lot of use to me is the parenting conference. We're mm -hmm. not talking about computers. We're talking about our children there. Uh -huh. So if you go to the parenting conference, you will find that there are a lot of topics within that parenting conference where people talk about where do you get a martial arts teacher for kids or what do you do about three-year-old jealousy mm -hmm. or a, a, a child of cyberspace or putting baby pictures up online. So you can talk to people who have similar problems that you might not otherwise be able to meet or, or get to have this conversation with, right? Yes, in fact you can have a, a kind of ready-made community when you need one. One real example of that was when one of the members of the community discovered that his son was diagnosed with leukemia. So he opened a topic on the well, gave a little introduction to that topic in which he discussed what was happening to him and his family. And really within minutes, other people began flocking to his help. Mm -hmm. And it was not just emotional support. There were a couple of doctors, a couple of nurses, and a couple of recovered leukemia patients. So that's the kind of priceless help you can get from people you may have never met before, but the well or other communities put you in touch with them. And, and you're on the well, but you might also be able to talk to people in another part of the country, another part of the world for that matter, that might, they might be dealing with similar problems. Oh, absolutely. You can get onto an on-ramp of the internet in Tokyo, and a second later, you are in the parenting conference of the well. Uh -huh. So that's what I mean by a virtual community, is the, the time and space constraints of our normal communities are not there. It's what we're interested in and what we talk with each other about that really defines our community here. Sure. All right, what else could we do on the well? What other kind of discussion or community could we get into, Howard? Well, you can go and talk about uh, computers. I'm using a Macintosh here. You can go to the Macintosh conference. This is, if you've got a problem and your best friend who knows about computers, his number is busy, you can log on to the well and there are experts who are fighting with each other to give you the kind of information you need to solve your problem. Howard, what's the social significance of this? Is this really a, a major change in the way human beings may interact with each other? You're suggesting that in, say, the leukemia case, for example. Well, I believe that it is. You have to remember that in democratic societies, citizens talking with each other is very important. We've lost a lot of that with the mass media. Now we have an opportunity for citizens to create their own communications with each other. So when these big deals with the big companies and the big governments carve up this new territory, I feel it's very important that we keep, keep a kind of social green belt, that yeah. we keep the ability for citizens to talk amongst each other. Briefly, Howard, is there a downside? I mean, there's something limited about meeting people electronically. We're here face to face. I kind of get the sense of who you are and so on and so forth. I is there something missing, some negative to this online community? I think it's important to remember that just as the com computer can con connect us with people, it can also distance us from people. And you need to know that just as you can't trust everyone you talk to on the telephone, you can't trust everyone you meet in a virtual community until you meet them and get to know them yeah. offline. Howard, thank you very much. That is our look at Internet. Stay tuned now for this week's Computer News on Random Access. In the random access file this week, there are some new entries in the sub-notebook category. Canon introduced the InnovaBook 10 10C family of monochrome and color portable computers. The Canon 486 SL sub-notebooks weigh 4 pounds and come bundled with MS-DOS 6.2 and Windows 3.1. One model comes with an internal bubble jet printer that's the smallest Canon printer ever made. Prices range from $1,600 to just over $2,000. Panasonic rolled out its new DX475 MHz notebook, which comes with a multimedia pocket. The pocket holds a floppy disk drive, which pops out to accept optional peripherals, including an internal CD-ROM drive, an extra battery pack, or a TV tuner. Prices range from $54 to $5,900. And Symantec has released version 2 of ACT for Windows, the popular contact management software, which helps you keep track of your business relationships. ACT 2.0 now includes network support, integrated email, and enhanced calendar printing functions. There's also a new version of ACT available for HP Palm Tops. 
Alacrity Systems has a new hardware-software bundle on the market called Office in a Box that turns your PC and printer into a digital copier, a plain paper fax machine, and an electronic filing cabinet. The $500 Office in a Box bundle includes a scanner, fax modem, and Alacrity's Equip software. And finally, in honor of the 25th anniversary of man's landing on the moon, Alpha Books has released a new title called Computers in Space, Journeys with NASA. The book contains rare photographs and extensive information on the role that computers played in putting people in space and information on the possibilities of computer technology in future NASA explorations. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Janelle Stelson. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by Intel, microprocessor technology for the software of today and tomorrow. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. And by Hewlett Packard, Personal Computer Division. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated and information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a newsletter, call 1 800 799 4949 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes. All orders include a free software program for auditing software use and information on the definitive guide to keeping your organization's software legal.